if you take a spur gear and you roll it out flat as if the teeth were a ribbon wrapped around the shaft if you roll those out flat you get a rack and a rack is this flat rectangular looking thing with teeth on it what a rack is handy for is converting between rotary motion and linear motion and it can go either way as this picture at the top illustrates you can rotate the pinion and that'll make the rack move back and forth or you can move the rack and that will make the pinion rotate and these are useful in all kinds of mechanical doodads uh, used to see them quite often in motorhome manufacturing where they had various kinds of uh, mechanical gizmos that came in and retracted they would use a lot of racks There's a spur gear that mates with a rack, and that spur gear we call it the pinion. And whatever the dimensions are in the spur gear, the circular dimensions, those same numbers are the linear dimensions in the rack. So for example, here is a pinion mating with a rack. Whatever the circular pitch was, the distance from one tooth to the next around the pitch circle, that is the same distance as the linear pitch on the rack, the horizontal distance from one tooth to the same place on the next tooth. So you can use that same gear tooth table with formulas in it that we've been looking at and use all those formulas that you've been using for spur gears to figure out whatever you're looking for in the rack. So circular pitch becomes linear pitch. Uh, circular addendum becomes linear addendum and so on and so forth. The one thing you will notice about a rack is that the sides of its teeth are flat. A spur gear has teeth with involute curves on their sides. A rack has flat tooth faces. And mathematically that's because theoretically this rack is, if, if you want to think about it abstractly, this rack is still a circular gear but it has a pitch diameter that's infinity big. And when you have a diameter that is infinity, you get a flat straight line. If that bugs you and you don't like it, just ignore what I just said. Uh, what you need to remember is that rack teeth are flat and the pressure angle that they give you for the gear is the slope of that gear tooth. Here's an example out of the same gear catalog we looked at earlier last week. Here are some rack teeth. Sometimes you see flat um, roots at the bottom of the teeth and sometimes you see them radiused. Here is the table out of Machinery's Handbook in case you like that sort of thing. I just offer it for your reference. Also for your reference, here is a page out of the ANSI standard for drawing gears. So here it tells you the kinds of data you need to include in the uh, gear cutting data table. And then here are the dimensions that ANSI says you should include in your drawing. I would point out that the height to the pitch line is a reference dimension according to the standard and this standard is so old that it's from the days before they switched over to symbols and a lot of things were written in English words so in the old days they wrote reference REF nowadays as you know we write reference by putting parentheses around our dimension here's an example out of our book that shows uh, various dimensions. There's the pitch line with a reference. 
This example from the book, this is a tool and die company up north near Portland. And this company uh, puts in the clearance. There's the clearance with a reference notation on it with parentheses. And here it is in the cutting table. Uh, I don't think that ANSI wants us to include that. And we will not include that in our drawing. I'm just pointing it out to you. So clearance is the space between the mating spur gear tooth and the bottom of the rack. Here's our assignment that we're going to draw. So you will dimension uh, the parts that are the gear blank as usual. Here's the height to the pitch line, the overall height, the height to the root, there's the face width, and you'll want to give a length. Now one thing I should point out is uh, this drawing is funky. He drew this isometric view of a rack as if the teeth had involute curves. And you now know that's wrong. They don't have involute curves. They're flat. We have a 20 degree pressure angle. So your teeth will be 20 degrees off of vertical. Here is uh, this, this drawing that we saw earlier in the slides where I've added in the numbers that you will use to draw your rack. Here is the 20 degree angle. So notice that is 20 degrees off of vertical. Here's the pitch line with the addendum and the dedendum. And added together, those make the whole depth. The linear pitch you will not dimension that on your drawing, but you do need to know the pitch because you need to know how far apart are your teeth. From one tooth to the same point on the next tooth in your rack will be 0.6283. And we've shown the mating pinion just because uh, I didn't want to erase it in Photoshop and it's just for reference but you will not draw that in your drawing. So you'll, you'll start drawing the gear blank stuff. And again, this is that example out of our book. So the numbers are different than the numbers will be on your rack. So here's a rectangular view showing the end view. I think yours is one and a half wide. And you'll draw the pitch line with a center line. And then you'll offset the up for the addendum and down for the dedendum. Then you'll make some construction lines. And using offset, I would say, uh, step off the linear pitch, how far apart are yours. What was your yours was 0.6283 I think. And you'll also want to step off what is the linear thickness for your tooth. So uh, I think that's shown in our assignment sheet. Here's the linear pitch 6283. The width, where did we put that? The tooth thickness is 0.3142. So the pitch is 6283. That's the space from tooth to tooth. And the tooth thickness at the pitch line is 3142. So that's what you will step off here. Once you have those construction lines in there, now you can draw in some 20 degree angles for the sides of the teeth. And what I like to do is I draw maybe two teeth and do some trimming so I get that little short root in between the teeth. And then I do copy, copy, copy. And as with spur gears and bevel gears, of course, we'll dimension the sizes that relate to the gear blank before we cut the teeth. And we'll add a data table 
for the settings that our shop person will put into the gear hobbing machine in order to cut the teeth. Here is what my rack looked like before I cleaned it up. So here's the rack. It's drawn the correct size and it's got 36 teeth on it. And by the way, I just, I drew a bunch of teeth and I figured out how far does that flat land have to be on each end of the last tooth. Okay, so here's my rack with 36 teeth. And what you might notice is, ooh, those teeth look pretty small. And if you want to put any dimensions in here, it's just kind of hard to see. And that's a lot of teeth. Who needs them? So here's what I recommend you do if you want to. As an alternative, you can draw just a few teeth and then make break lines in the middle. And that's what I have done here. Uh, let's see. In, in my first drawing where I put all 36 teeth in, I had to scale it down at a scale of 1 to 2 to make it all fit. In my second attempt, I was able to scale it at a scale of 1 to 1 because I chopped out a bunch of those teeth in the middle. I decided just to show two teeth on each end. You could make a different choice. And I made a squiggly break line in here. Now, as me does not uh, tell us how big these squiggles have to be, nor what angle they have to be. So just make something that looks good to you. And you make two of them. Make one break line and then make a copy of it so they're spaced a little bit apart and trim out your gear in between them. And then you connect the, the missing gear teeth with a phantom line. That means there was something in here I'm not showing it. Here's a phantom line. And now your length, which is supposed to be 24 inches, is not correct. So you need to tell them this uh, length is not drawn to scale. And you can do that by adding a jog. There are other ways. Uh, another way is to draw a line, an underline under the number. I think that's an older way. But AutoCAD makes it simple to add this jog. So here's what you do. You dimension your length. And mine happened to be this odd length. Yours will be some different length, but it'll be odd. All right, so I made my picture with the break lines, and I put a dimension on here. Then, in the annotate ribbon, I don't think this command is in our regular home ribbon. I think you have to go to the annotate ribbon. In the dimension panel, there's an icon here that looks like a jog. Yay! So you select that jog icon, and it will say specify jog location. Uh, oh, first it will say select dimension, so you select your dimension. Then it will say specify jog location. So you just click wherever on your dimension line you would like the jog to be, and it will automatically put that in. It's super fast. Then, as a last step, edit the dimension text. Change that text. And you can open the text editor by double-clicking on the dimension text change it and then close it. Let me just say, I hope this feels really bad to you because you you should remember never ever edit dimension text. There are very few times when that's okay. This is one of the few times. Most of the time we draw exactly to scale and the dimension reports what the size is. It's only when you've made a break in a part and it's no longer to scale and you put a jog in there that it's okay to change that number. Okay, uh, there you go and let me know if you have